I have to say that I enjoyed uh, the Bennett's talk uh, quite a bit. It was a great talk, wasn't it? Yeah. Unfortunately for me, I have a confession to make. As uh, the speech uh, started, I started to develop a pain in my left side as my wife elbowed me every time she mentioned the choleric word. That's you, honey. Wham! So I'm going to be sort of tilting to this side, and it's because of that. Anyway, so my name is Otong Wiltz. Um, I'm here with my beautiful wife, Mary Carmen, which is the one that actually hit me in the side, and you can excuse her for that. Um, we're both uh, Cuban-Americans, grew up in Puerto Rico, and uh, incredibly enough, now for the last two years, live in the United Arab Emirates, or UAE. We live specifically in Abu Dhabi, which is the capital of the UAE. And as you probably know and have thought, as I did, uh, Dubai is one of those emirates. Uh, it is not a country, it's one of the seven emirates um, that comprise the UAE. Now, this past year was uh, a very eventful year for the UAE and for us. We had pretty much uh, a, sort of a groundbreaking historic set of events. The first one was monumental. And as you recall, in February of this year, the Holy Father, Pope Francis, visited the UAE. And for the first time in Catholic history, the Holy Father, a Pope, said an outdoor mass, a public mass in the Arabian Peninsula. And that was a, a I mean, it was a, just an incredible event. There were about 150,000 of us packed into a stadium uh, when the Holy Father uh, was brought in with people from all parts of the world there to receive him. The second very, very monumental historic event uh, took, care, to, took place when a set of folks from Beirut from the IFFD, from Beirut, specifically Zeyna Barakat. She's here, she was here visiting. Zeyna. Zeyna came down uh, from uh, Lebanon and uh, visited us in Dubai and gave us the first introductory talks and the first case study uh, to a small group of couples. She did a great job. Uh, she's a superstar, as you all know, um, and we got very excited. We're a very small group of people there, actually exactly three couples. Uh, and with the help, uh, initially, and the guidance of Leticia Rodriguez, who you all know very well, we're planning and working very hard to start the first family enrichment course in Dubai and Abu Dhabi. And I can probably assure you it's going to be the first course in the Arabian Peninsula as well. So two very, very important events this coming year. We will start with a course on matrimonial love. And uh, we want to thank ahead of time all the effort and uh, guidance that we will receive for sure from IFFD, specifically from the group in Beirut. And, uh, and we ask you to uh, certainly keep us in your prayers because we're going to need them. Um, it's funny, I, I came to do some training to become a moderator and my wife and I were looking at each other and we're going to be a team leader, a participant, a moderator and a steering committee. So <laughs> it's going to be good. <laughs> anyway, enough about me um, and us and let me, uh, I'm going to have the great honor to introduce our, our next, next speaker. Tom Harrison, uh, who is the Director of Education at the Jubilee Center for Character and Virtues and leads the applied research projects across Britain and internationally. His interests are character and virtue ethics, youth social action, citizenship, community development, and volunteering. His recent publications include Teaching Character Through the Curriculum, Educating Character Through Stories, and teaching character in primary schools. He has completed his PhD at the University of Birmingham about nine years ago 
on the influence of the internet on character virtues. His talk today for us is going to be titled, or is titled, Flourishing Online. Tom. Thank you. Thank you very much for that generous uh, introduction. And I want to say a really big thank you, firstly, to the uh, organizers here, IFFD, uh, for inviting me to come and speak to you today. It really is a, a, a pleasure, uh, in particular to Leticia and to Ignatius and to Ian and all the other people uh, who have made it possible for me to come and talk to such a wonderful, and I have to say, significant uh, large audience. Not that I can see many of you out there, but I believe there is a lot of people uh, behind these lights. Um, I was actually, I did speak in Colombia on a very similar topic to this recently, and I was actually invited to speak at this conference a year ago. And then I didn't actually hear much until I'd spoken in Colombia. And then about 10 minutes later, I got an email popping into my email from Leticia saying, just to confirm the details of when you're going to be uh, speaking at the conference. It turned out that Ignatius had been sent out as a spy to Colombia to see if I was any good uh, to come and speak to you as an audience. I must have passed that test and I do hope that I'm able to deliver again for you today. But what I'm going to be speaking about is uh, these. Anyone seen one of these before a mobile phone? <laughs> Believe it or not, they're quite good, actually. I recommend it. No, I'm going to be speaking about uh, mobile phones, and um, what, I, what I really want to be talking about is, and trying to convince you today, is that these are actually just pieces of technology. That what actually really matters is the humans, our heart, our values, our virtues, who we are behind the technology, is what actually really matters. Quite often we get obsessed as parents, uh, about people in our family, about their obsession with uh, phones and with screen time and, and the issues, whether it be sexing or pornography or whatever else, associated with bullying with mobile phones. But I want to talk about it's us, it's the humans, it's our heart behind these today. But they are actually, obviously, incredibly important uh, uh, and powerful pieces of technology. I've just noticed my wife sent me a text, actually, I better turn this off. Uh, <laughs> She's probably saying, where are you? But um, <laughs> have you got the bread, she said. OK. Um, <laughs> later, I'm going to write. No, um, these are obviously incredibly powerful pieces of technology. But it's actually one of these uh, pieces of uh, technology that I recently gave to my daughter, who is 11 years old. Now, some of you, and I know a lot of you will be parents, families uh, within the audience here today, will be thinking about, you know, whether your children should have mobile phones, whether they should be allowed to access these incredible pieces of technology. And it was a really big decision when I gave my 11-year-old daughter, Isla, uh, her mo first mobile phone. In fact, when I did this talk in Colombia, um, uh, someone came up afterwards and they came straight up to me and said, I can't believe you gave your phone to an 11-year-old daughter. I'm never going to let my children have a piece of technology. I'm never going to let them have a smartphone. And I was like, that's fine. That's up to you. It's a parent's decision. At the end of the day, you know what is right and best for your, for your children. But then she did spend the next five minutes saying, are you on Twitter? Are you on Facebook? I can't find you on Instagram. Have you got... <laughs> And she's very upset with me for not having any social media accounts anywhere at all, uh, which she could actually connect with me on. Uh, but if you do want to tweet, there's the Jubilee Centre, which is the organisation I work for, which I'm going to tell you a bit about now. Uh, you can use that uh, Twitter handle if you want to connect. But as parents, we do have to make wise decisions about when we think it's right for our children to access the technology. I'm not sure if that's working. I'll try that. Um, okay, um, we have to make decisions about whether it's uh, right for our children to access technology. And I'm going to be speaking today as a parent of two children, but also as an academic. I work for the Jubilee Centre for Character and Virtues. This is a big research centre, probably the biggest in the world, based at the University of Birmingham in the UK. And we look at the place of character, the place of virtues and values in society, whether that be in schools, whether that be in families, whether that be in the voluntary sector, whether that be with some of our politicians. Uh, we've had a spot of problem around here, you may have noticed in our country. 
quite a lot of work on character and virtue to do with what's going on over the road uh, down there. But we work with lots of different uh, areas to look at what is the importance of character and virtue. And as Aristotle said here, who's often seen as the founding father of character. He was one of the first people to talk about character as being the basis for human flourishing. He says it's, 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 our examination is not to know what to do, but actually to be good. And as a parent, that's my, my role. I, I spend my life reading books as an academic. But what I really want to know is what is the practice? What should I do to help my children be successful but also to flourish online. What is my role in that? And that's what I'm hoping to talk about today. A bit of the theory, but hopefully gets the practice about what you might actually, uh, we might actually be doing. Um, I have to say, as the director for the Jubilee Centre for Character and Virtues, director of education, I, um, I have failed to actually tell any of my friends at home or my school parent, uh, my children's teachers that that is my role just in case they start looking at me when my kids are running around completely manically around our village. And they go, Tom, you're supposed to know something about this uh, as my children tear up. So, uh, so, I mean, there's a general feeling that, um, and there's been books, if you look at uh, the first two books, that's back when the internet really began to start to become popular back in the late 90s, when te technology internet really took off, but also recent books that are really making the case that the kids are all right. And I think um, for me that actually I can, I can kind of understand that point, that in many ways um, I think that technology it can be used for a force for good, or for bad. And a lot of these uh, books are basically saying, leave the kids to it, the children know best, it's their digital natives, let them get on with actually using that technology. And my argument is not, is very much that we, as I say, it's how we as humans, how our children use these tools is what really matters. We can't take what is often called a deterministic account, that because these mobile phones or the laptops or the tablets exist, that necessarily bad things are gonna happen. Those very same technologies can be used for a lot of good things that can truly change society. We have global problems, we have a global audience here, but we have global problems that are shared across all of us, whether it be environmental action or poverty or all the other issues that affect us. These technologies could be the source for that. So I take a positive view of technology. However, they're actually, um, idea that young people are digital natives, I do want to de deconstruct a bit. I don't think we can say that all children are necessarily digital natives. For at uh, one point, half the world is not actually got internet, got uh, mobile phones. So we can't actually just assume that everyone is connected in that idea of digital natives. But also there's different things. We get obsessed with screen time, our children watching screens. But actually we've got to ask, what are they using it for? It's very different if my daughter does all her homework now on the computer, that's screen time, to uh, a lot of children who use it to play Fortnite or what other games. They are very different uses of this screen time. So we need to get down to actually look what this screen time is actually um, going to actually be using it for, you know. So that's, that's the argument. We need to look and, and we need to not assume our children are digital natives. But what we need to be as parents, is actually digital immigrants and good digital immigrants. As an immigrant to any place, you can either be a forced immigrant or you can voluntarily choose to go to that place. I hope when you came to London, uh, uh, those of you who've traveled here today, you've been treated well, you've been treated kindly, uh, you've been treated with compassion. But hopefully you've come here voluntarily and, what, and you know, kind of wanted to share and be part of this culture and this place for the time you're here. Well, that's the same qualities we need to learn when we adopt to use technologies. We need to want to get and be involved and learn and play and share and live alongside our children successfully with courage and compassion in those sorts of spaces. So it's actually what do we do as digital immigrants, I think is more important than trying to think of all our children as necessarily digital natives. So my question is, are the kids actually really all right? So although I have a positive take on the internet, I think there's lots of research and evidence out there that suggests that the technology in some ways is neutral. And it's actually 
about how we use it, as I've said. And actually, it, can, how it brings risks and opportunities. It brings uh, uh, potential problems, but it also brings a great deal of um, uh, opportunities for our, for our children in, those, in the use of those technologies. So and I, the question is, do we really want to risk it? Do we actually really want our children uh, to necessarily be exposed to all the moral and issues and challenges that we know exist out there? I don't need to be a researcher, I just need to speak to my friends, uh, to my parents' friends, to know that there's things such as sexting and cyberbullying and piracy and play, online plagiarism and uh, all these gaming addiction, which has just been uh, classed as an addiction by the World Health Organization. We know these problems exist. So we don't want to do nothing, I don't think. I don't think we want to sit there and just assume the kids are going to be all right. I think we actually do need to be proactive. My friend the other day, uh, he must have found out my role, um, uh, and he did phone me up and he said, my son, my son Noah, has just um, committed a horrible thing on WhatsApp. And I know Noah really well. He, he's not the sort of boy who would write nasty things on WhatsApp, but by being begged by his uh, friends in the new school that he's gone to, he sent a message across all of his class on WhatsApp. And his, his dad was horrified. He said, this isn't my son, but something about this technology has allowed or made my son send something which he truly regrets and probably be one of the best lessons he could possibly get in that technology. But things happen. So I don't think that we can sit idly by and just assume the kids are going to be all right. We actually do need to do something about it. But the big question is, what can we do about it? What can we actually do about it? And as an academic, as someone who works in a university, someone who did a PhD on this topic, I'd like to think that we can turn to the research to help us. But actually, the research is not very helpful. It suffers from a lot of problems. It's often deterministic, as I say. It's often suggesting, because X exists, Y will happen. Two very clever researchers at the University of Oxford just did a massive study, taking loads of data, uh, trying to link screen time to well-being issues, you know, mental health, these sorts of issues. And what they found is, whatever way they ran the data, they could get different answers. So they could get a headline that was saying that um, uh, social, uh, social media is really bad for mental health. And they could also get a headline that, that says that social media is really good for mental health, depending how they ran the data in different ways. It's hugely problematic, uh, the actual research. We haven't got longitudinal studies. We don't know how this technology is going to affect us in 20, 30, 50 years time. It's like smoking. We didn't know what was going to happen from smoking over the long time. We now know. We're at that stage with technology right now. We're not quite sure what it's going to affect us. A lot of the research is out of date quickly because you may research one app or one feature and suddenly all the children are using a different app or feature. Facebook rates are actually going down because children are using other technology. Often what we find is a lot of the research is contradictory, as I say, showing two sides of different pictures. So I think what we need to be, and it's not surprising that a lot of this research is actually underutilised in practice. That we as parents or teachers amongst us in the audience just don't really know what to do in these situations. We're just not quite sure. We feel quite often, I feel this as a parent, quite often I'm making it up as I go along. I'm trying to uh, bring my daughter up and my son up the best I possibly can in this new cyber world and this internet age. But I haven't got any hard places to turn to in terms of what I should do. So what I've done and what I've gone back to, and I've got a book coming out about this called Thrive in the next few, in the next year actually, by the time I've written it. Uh, and um, <laughs> it will be in the next year, I promised a lot of people, it will be. Um, it's coming out with a publisher, the person who published Carol Dweck's Mindsets books is publishing my book on Thrive in the next year. Um, and what I've done is I've gone back to the theory. Aristotle, when he was thinking about what uh, requires for us to flourish, to really thrive in, in the world, had to go to theory. He believed in research, he believed in what he called naturalism, that you, anything that you had research, you had to find out. Does it actually stand true when you actually get there? But we need to start with a framework, we need to start with some ideas about what we should do in this situation. And so I've gone back to theory to think about what ways that we uh, can actually start to formulate an educational approach, an educational framework to helping our children, whether we be parents or teachers. Um, 
And I just want to do a kind of a test of that big, um, uh, uh, I'm going to do a big experiment now. Aristotle will be very pleased. I'm going to do a big experiment now with all of you. And what I want, I'm going to give you some options in a minute. And I'm going to ask you to stand up. And you're only allowed to stand up for one. So no cheating. I'm watching all of you. You're only allowed to stand up for one. And I want to say, if you are absolutely pushed, who do you think ultimately is responsible for ensuring that people act morally, act with compassion and honesty and kindness and generosity and uh, integrity and these things online. Whose responsibility really do we think this is? So the options I'm going to give you is no ones, the tech companies, the Googles, the Apples, the IBMs, all the rest of the world. Is it government's responsibility, either a single government or a group of governments? Is it our responsibility, us? I mean us, all of us our responsibility, or is there someone else that I've forgotten on that list? Is there someone else? Okay, so have a think about that question. We're going to start with number one. If you think it's, uh, it's the first one, that it's no one's responsibility to ensure people act uh, morally online, could you just stand up for me? Right. So either you've got no idea what I'm talking about, <laughs> which is going to be bad news, because I've done ten minutes already, but... Or uh, you don't think no one's got any responsibility. So I'm going to just take it as the latter option that actually probably a lot of you think that it is someone's responsibility that this technology, this internet, is actually used in a responsible and moral way. I agree with you. I would have sat down as well. OK, let's go to the next one. Tech companies. Well, who, who thinks that, uh, you know, really pushed? It's the Apples, the Googles, uh, uh, Facebooks, Twitters, Instagram, whatever it may be. It's their responsibility for ensuring this uh, is, uh, technology is um, kind of used by people to, to act morally online. So stand up anyone who's going for the tech companies. Come on, be brave. There's got to be someone out there who thinks. <laughs> Thank you, madam. Thank you very much. One of the greatest... Yeah, stand out amongst the crowd. I agree with you. Thank you. For one of me, one of, one of the most important character qualities, I think, is courage. And I think that lady... I mean, she may not have actually believed that, but she's definitely shown <laughs> some courage by standing up in front of a thousand people and saying she believes the tech companies. To be honest, I would, be on, I would uh, think that they actually do have responsibility. Not the primary responsibility, but I think our tech companies. This, my talk here isn't about letting the tech companies off. But e uh, Google's uh, slogan was, do, don't, do, don't be evil. How much have Google really done to ensure that slogan is fulfilled in terms of don't be evil? I'm not sure they've done as much as they could have done, even if they had that intention. I think they could have done more. But why would government tech organisations actually want to self-regulate? It goes against the market. It goes against business. They are resistant to regulating or self-policing or regulating themselves. No companies would like this. They want less regulation. Although that is changing a bit. Mark Zuckerberg is beginning to talk about self-regulation because he's realised this stuff has got out of control. The question is, can they turn the tanker around? Is it too late for them to actually be able to do that? We all know that when one app is pushed down, then another app pops up somewhere else, which is doing a similar thing. Can we turn around? So the governments, right, who's standing up for the government? Who thinks it's government's responsibility to make sure we act morally online? We've got a few people with their hands up. They don't actually want to stand up, but they want to put their hands up, which is apps. Oh, we've got a standing up as well. We've got a few more people. Oh, look, they're popping up everywhere now. So there's a few. There's a few people who are saying governments, that's their responsibility. Uh, all I can say after Brexit in this country is good luck. We're getting a... Uh... <laughs> Your politicians and policy makers to be able to make any difference here. As it happens, Nikki Morgan, who I know quite well, who's the, um, she's head of what was called a Department of Culture, Media and Sport here, DCMS. She actually wrote a big book on character education called Taught Not Caught. I'm quoted in about the first page, which is amazing, but then she quotes me wrong, which isn't so good. But um, <laughs> she's one of our main politicians here. This week, she uh, took down what was uh, called the porn block. There was going to, there, our government was going to put a block up to stop under 18 year olds accessing pornography without showing that they, got creden they are over that age. They tried it. They could not make it work. She had to drop that policy. They had to just abandon it. That happened on Wednesday this week. 
Governments are really struggling to regulate the internet. Even if their will wants to do it, they are struggling to actually make that happen. It's too big, it's too vast, it's too multicultural. Some countries have done some great things. Some countries have done some very draconian things, you know, really shut down, uh, restrict access to particular sites. Is that the world we want to live in, where our governments are making the decisions what we can access? It's a big problematic moral question. I think governments have got a role, but are they able to do it pragmatically? Okay, how about us? Who thinks it's our responsibility? <laughs> Very good. Lots of waving. Thank you very much. Okay, sit down. Um, the reason I did that is science shows that if you stand up, you get a lot more oxygen to your brain and you're going to focus a bit more <laughs> for the second half of my talk, you see. So actually, I was just trying to keep you awake by, uh, by doing that. So yeah, us. I, basically, that's what I'm going to come to. I think that it's actually we've got some responsibility. Too often, we often think other people will sort this for us. We, whether it be the children, our children themselves, or parents and adults, have got some responsibility to this. I'm not going to go to someone else, although some of you might want to challenge me afterwards about other people, and I'm happy to, to do that. But other people think it's us. Tim Berners-Lee, Sir Tim Berners-Lee, who was credited with inventing the World Wide Web, the internet, over 30 years ago, they've just had a manifesto out, 30 years later, he said this, he said, the web is for everyone, and collectively we hold the power to change it. He said, we, we, we dream a little and work a lot, we can get to the web we want. He believed in individual power to be able to actually change things. A lot of the internet pioneers at the start had great hopes for the internet. They really did think it would change the world, it would get us to solve global issues. But he's still fighting, he still believes that the internet uh, and our use of the internet can actually mature. We can mature with it. So what does character education in the fourth industrial revolution actually look like? Well, for me, I think it's got to be a focus on human qualities because these mark us out from AI. I don't know any AI right now that's very good at showing empathy. If you know differently, uh, you can tweak me. But our children are going to go into roles that AI can't do. They're going to go into roles that we need to show human qualities. That's what employers are going to look for. Because the AI can do the manufacturing, it can do all the zeros and noughts to get things done efficiently and practically and, and all the rest of it. But actually it's the human qualities that are going to be important within that. We need our children to focus on character and coding. Our country brought in, a, our government brought in all schools have to do coding. Great, they should do coding. But actually coding is not enough. We know in anything, any profession, any quality, that that quality can be used for good or for bad. You need character to go alongside it. Martin Luther King said something similar. He said, knowledge plus character, that is the goal of education. Mahatma Gandhi put uh, in his, um, one of his kind of main speeches, he talked about the importance of character being at the heart of any education. It's not enough just to have the maths, the English, the science. These are important. But you need character because that's how you apply it wisely in society and that's how you use maths and English and, uh, and whatever it may be for, for good, for human good. So we need both of those and we need a focus on character virtues and I'm going to talk to you about that. But character virtues are essentially liberating, they're freeing, they help us be the best of ourselves in society and link and connect. I know all of you, because uh, you're all so late coming in from coffee, we're just having a brilliant time out there sharing with other people from other countries, being human, you know, connecting with people, showing virtues, that is essentially what marks us out. And these are the things that are really important for us to focus on. I won't go into this too long, but basically we did some research recently, say our parents and teachers on the same page. What we discovered was that although parents and teachers both prioritise character over attainment, if they had to, they said, which one would you really want, the GCSE or the exam results or good character in your children? Both parents and teachers both said character, if they had to, which is good. But then we asked them what they thought the other one thought, and actually teachers thought that the parents were prioritising attainment, and the parents thought that the teachers were prioritising attainment. So they were, though they were both on the character side, they both thought the others was a prioritising attainment. So how much are you speaking to your parents, uh, sorry, your teachers, about whether you've got shared uh, uh, understanding, shared knowledge, shared communication on the importance of character. Because our research shows that most people prioritise it over a lot of other educational concerns. 
So going back to theory, I want to give you a very briefly my theoretical foundation approach, and then I'm going to get into practice. What does that actually look like in practice? So I think we can take inspiration from the ancient Greeks in two ways. And people think I'm mad. I had an article about this fairly recently in one of the newspapers, and I was saying, we can learn how to use our smartphone from the ancient Greek wisdom. And, the people, and they had a big picture of Aristotle holding a mobile phone in there. It was, uh, it was quite an interesting picture. But um, there's two things. One is cyber. The word cyber is often seen for bad. It's like cyber bullying or cyber warfare. I want to reclaim that word cyber. Cyber in ancient Greek actually means kubernetes, which is to steer or to be a helmsman. I think that's a helpful thing for us to think about as parents. How am I, as a parent, helping my children to navigate or to steer her or his, my son's, way through the really difficult terrain that is the internet, that is their use of having a mobile phone? What am I doing to help them navigate and steer? In some ways, what sort of moral compass am I giving them to help them to allow to steer? This note, this isn't me steering them through it. This isn't me telling them how to go or how to move. It's what am I doing so that they can be in charge? They are the helmsmen. They are actually steering and taking charge. So that's the first concept. And the second one is, um, and this is your uh, moral philosophy or moral theory uh, lecture in two minutes. I'm giving you a moral lecture in two minutes. You don't get a certificate at the end of it. But um, there's three main moral theories. Uh, virtue ethics, deontology and utilitarian, these are the three main reasons when asked the question why do you do the right thing or what is the right thing to do, people normally answer in these three ways. Deontological Kantian theory, this is largely I agree Western theory but it holds in a lot of the part of the world. Deontological theory is we do the right things because there's rules out there. Now of course we need rules, uh, the motorways would not be very good if we didn't have some rules uh, as you can imagine. But I don't think rules are enough in the mobile or in the internet age. I know children who are getting burner phones. That's what criminals used to have, burner phones that their parents don't know about so that they can bypass their parents' uh, you know, detection of what's actually going on. Or kids who are clever enough to change the time on their phone so that when it's supposed to have a restriction on it, they're still actually able to use it through the night because they've changed the time clock on it. Our kids are pretty clever. They get round the rules. That's why the porn block wasn't going to work here, because they realised kids were very quickly in this country going to get round all of those blocks. So rules don't really work very well online. So that's not going to help us that much, but it will help a bit. Utilitarian is consequentialist. It's about uh, a, a measure of kind of pleasure. It's a measure of the, the right thing to do is which one, when we do a calculation, looks better to do in difficult situations. It makes my philosopher uh, colleagues spend hours uh, thinking about these sorts of kind of strange uh, dilemmas that may once happen. And I keep saying, get real, let's look at what's happening in the real world right now. My dad's a philosopher, so I'm able to say that. I grew up in a household where he was somewhere else most of the time. But <laughs> in his head and, no, I won't go into that. Um, uh, but utilitarian, that's telling our, that means our kids have to work out the consequences of our actions. Well, I can't work out the consequences of my actions online. I send an email to one person. The next thing I know, either that person's got upset because of my email, and I didn't mean them to, but they've read it in the wrong way, or my email has been sent to hundreds of people that I wasn't expecting that email to go to. It's the same when our kids take a photo or they think it's a private photo and suddenly it's shared around the whole of the school. It's really hard to know the consequences of actions with mobile phone, with the time and space dimensions have changed the world, Dif things happen differently. So that means we need to go back, I think, to virtue ethics, which is character and wisdom and who we are. So we, rules are good and uh, consequences good. We might call them carrots and sticks. We do need some sticks. We do need some carrots to help our kids uh, survive or thrive online. But we need to educate their character. They need to be making these decisions themselves self-policing through them. So for me, the main quality we should be developing on our children is cyber wisdom, which is doing the right thing at the right time in the right amount, but no, when importantly, no one is watching. Because so many of our children are using their mobile phones in their bedrooms late at night when no one is actually watching them. So can we help them do, I'll say a bit more about this in a minute, but can we help them do the right thing at the right time when nobody is watching? 
And there's a number of virtues, a number of human qualities that we need to educate in them to help them make better virtuous decisions. And I'll go through some of these. The one at the bottom right, performance virtues, this is the one probably we hear the most from, certainly from our politicians. Things like leadership, teamwork, resilience, these are really important qualities. My big question about resilience, because we hear about resilience everywhere here, and I don't know if it's in your country, but the question is resilience for what? There's a lot of criminals who are pretty resilient. <laughs> There's a lot of people selling drugs around this world that are pretty resilient. So actually, we've got to think a bit more about these performance virtues. Leadership, teamwork, uh, you know, uh, these sorts of things can be used for good or for bad. I think what we should see them as is the muscles. They're the muscles for the other ones. They need to be applied to either the intellectual, the moral, the civic virtues, if they're actually going to be good. They're not goods in themselves. We need to be applied. Civic virtues, things like volunteering, citizenship, neighbourliness, civility, agreeing disagreeably. Sorry, disagree, disagreeing agreeably, got that the wrong way around. Disagreeing agreeably, that's kind of good service, good neighbourliness. Uh, moral virtues, I've said a lot of them already. Compassion, honesty, courage, kindness, uh, integrity, really, really obviously important human qualities that bind us. A lot of people criticise character education saying it's divisive or it's indoctrinating or it's about one, you know, a, a religious view necessarily. I would say most of these qualities, I've said, most people around the world seem to think are a good thing. They can unite us, they can bring us together, the moral qualities. And the intellectual virtues, because character is not non-cognitive. It's not a soft skill, it's about thinking about the right thing to do. We have to reason, we have to think. It's about showing intellectual qualities to make judgments in our life. And that's why the middle one is so important. Practical wisdom, or phronesis in the Greek term, is the applied use of those virtues. Because quite often, actually, two virtues that we both think are good, us or our children, have to make a decision between. And I'm going to give you a, a, a frivolous or a joke example and then a more serious one of this. But when my wife comes downstairs when we're going out for dinner, she says, how do I look? And I have to think, am I going to give the honest answer? <laughs> or am I going to give her the compassionate answer? <laughs> Compassion's a good thing. Honest is a good thing. Which one do I choose? Don't worry, I always choose compassionate one. <laughs> the problem is, I don't always choose it for the right reasons. Because if I give the honest answer, our dinner is not going to be very good. Uh, and also, we're going to be even later than we're probably running already at that time. So, so true character is actually doing the right thing for the right reasons. It's not just giving the right answer. That's true character. But they're also, I'll give you another example, which our children do face. My daughter faced this recently. Uh, on WhatsApp, there was some uh, kind of anonymous kind of bullying going on in one of the WhatsApp groups. And she knew who it was. And she had to choose between loyalty, which she's been told is a good thing, and honesty, which she's been told is a good thing. Is she loyal to her friend and not say anything, or is she honest to me when I ask her who has been doing these things? That is real life. In any situation in your jobs, you will think of practical ethical dilemmas, which actually call on practical wisdom, us to do the right thing. When maybe there aren't any rules, or we don't like the rules, and we think we need to do the more character-based thing in that situation. Or when there's two goods, and we have to choose which is the wise one to do. It's cyber wisdom or practical wisdom that we should be really seeking to educate in our children. So what does that actually uh, look like? Um, well, I think, sorry, how do we go about this? I'm just checking on the time. I think I'm still all right for a bit. I can't see what time it is, but... 15 minutes. Oh, perfect, okay. Uh, there will be time for questions, I think, which, so prepare some easy questions for me. Um, <laughs> uh, so character is, um, I think character is talk, court and sort, and I'm going to go through them. So you say, how do you develop this cyber wisdom? Tom, what should I be doing as a parent to develop cyber wisdom or to develop uh, character in, uh, in my children? And I think there's three things we need to attend to. First is character court. Who I am as a parent, my character qualities have the biggest say on how my children are going to turn out, certainly in the early years. Unfortunately, they're beginning to take more notice of their friends than me. I don't know how that's happened, but 
Um, but in the early years, it, you know, in all years, character is caught. It's about the environment they grow up in. It's about the values. It's about the, uh, you know, it's about the places that our children are actually exposed to and learn about what really, really matters and what, what's uh, important in life. So character is largely caught. When someone said, when did, where did you develop your character? No one would ever say, oh, I learned mine in a 40 minute lesson. You know, that's not how you learn how to be or develop these character qualities. Characters caught from those areas. But it is also, I think, can be taught. As I say, not taught in a didactic, in a lecture, in a, uh, a, a classroom session on uh, honesty or, or whatever. But if we are explicit, if we try and think about what we're doing in the way of developing cyber wisdom and character in our children, then firstly, and the most importantly, our children will realise this stuff is important. If we tell them these things matter, then they're more likely to think that themselves. We've made it explicit that stuff's important. We've also given them a language to talk about these things and to think and reflect on themselves. We've given them some tools to be able to think about these. And I've got whole programs to study in the book. There'll be lots of activities that make it look more like character education taught, so how you actually teach what you might do to actually teach. Court is still more important, but you can do a lot of talk. But ultimately, what we want is sort. This is that when children leave schools, when they leave our house, when they leave home, that they are showing the sorts of qualities we hope they will show because they've sought or seek out opportunities to do that. Not behaviourism. It's not about getting our kids to do the right thing because they have been told they have to do it or they will be punished if they don't do it or they have been rewarded if they will do it. I'm as bad as anyone. I do sometimes give my kids sweets, you know, to try and get them to do something. But it's not a very good way of actually getting them to be the sorts of person I want in the long run. It's, you know, we're, children are not like dogs. Dogs, we can train to do things by giving them a treat and uh, they should do what they're told. Kids are not like that. They're too clever. They're too bright. We need them to seek out these things because they want to show these qualities in their own way. So ultimately, we need activities that get at character sort to help them do that in their own way. So uh, I've got two models which would fill the uh, taught and sort stuff and I'll briefly go through these and then I'll stop for questions. So the first model I've got is something called the REACT model. This is the model for what we should be as educators, as parents, as teachers. What should we be? And I think there's a, uh, the reason I'm called REACT is because it's a non-deterministic account. It's the technology exists, what we're helping our children do is how to react to that technology. Not react it, re reject it, how they should react to having that technology. It's not based on a duality that the technology is good or bad. It could be both. Uh, but it actually prioritises their human agency. It prioritises who they are. They're in control of their technology. They are empowered to actually think about that way. And actually, I think that one of the most important parts of the React model is reacting, but with a pause. Most stuff goes wrong online because of the instantaneous nature of it because our kids don't stop to think what they do before they push the send button or they, or, or they share something or they pass something on. If we can only get our children to pause, to think, to stop for a second, to allow their character to really think through what is the right thing to do in a decision, then we're a lot better. So that's why the React model is so important. And it's made up of these things. It is about being a rule maker. That's the R of the React model. We do need some ground rules. I've got ground rules for my daughter. She doesn't have the mobile phone in her bedroom at night time. I've restricted some of the apps that she can go into. I have a rule that she has to share some communication with me. So we're doing this in partnership. We're doing this together. Of course, we need some rules, but they are the ground rules. They're the rules that you build the character on top of. They're the platform. They're the foundation. We build everything on top of that. Then we need to think about what we're doing as an exemplar. As I say, character court's the most important thing. What are we doing to help our children be the sorts of people we'd like them to be? My kids are the first to tell me off when I've told them something and then I'm doing it. Like saying, get off your mobile phone and talk at family meal and then I'm on my mobile phone at the meal. They will tell me off quite quickly for that. I am modelling, I am exemplifying things all the time. I have to be constantly switched on to think about what I'm actually showing. So it's how we exemplify 
Then we need to be an advisor. An advisor is a coach, it's a mentor, it's a supporter. It's someone you can have a conversation with your children and help them through the dilemmas and the challenges and everything that they actually see. It's not about teaching them how to be, it's advising them, it's helping them, it's acting as a, uh, you know, someone who can really help them in those situations. Uh, but ultimately, we need to be a character champion. We, as I've, for many uh, slides before, I've shown why the character qualities is what we really need to focus on. It's the, it's the performance and the intellectual and the moral and the civic virtues that actually are ultimately going to mean that they can use these technologies for, for good. And I think if you get all of those, you'll get Thrive. And then the Thrive model is what our children need to be. These are the qualities I think we need to educate in our children if they are to uh, be successful. And thoughtful is two ways. We need them to be thoughtful because actually most of the moral dilemmas online are linked with compassion. A lot of the cyberbullying and all these other issues are linked to are we being kind and compassionate to other people. So we need to be thoughtful as to be compassionate. But also that's looking at other people. But we also need to be thoughtful by looking at ourselves or getting our children to be reflective on themselves to reflect on their own actions, to stop and think about their own actions. So thoughtful is two things. It's outward looking to others and it's inward looking to, um, to ourselves. We need to be human. We need to remind our kids that they're in control of the technology. You probably do exactly what I do with Google Maps all the time. You know, I've forgotten to, how to roll down the window or ask people where to go. I just put it in the Google Map and then follow it around. I've missed about five opportunities to speak to people in a local area or a new area that I've actually gone and connect in that sort of human way because I've relied on the technology to actually get us around. We need to be reasonable, able, which is that's all the stuff about practical wisdom. Are they able to reason through what is the best thing to do in any situation? When something pops into their social media, are they able to reason through what is the best thing they should do? What's the right thing they should do? Can they act with integrity? Integrity is more than honesty. Honesty is a big thing, but integrity is what you are seen as over the duration of your life. It's all the little moments. It's having an identity and then living up to that identity through all their life. If our kids have an identity of who they'd like to be, then they can match their actions against that. They can see that journey. Are they staying on that? Are they being virtuous? That's all the other qualities, the character qualities I've talked about. But ultimately, we want them to be an exemplar themselves. Because that's how you get a virtuous circle. That's how you get a circle that um, means that they will be teaching their children, your grandchildren, uh, believe it or not, uh, how to use these technologies themselves. It's that virtuous simple. We want them to be an exemplar to their friends, to their peers, and obviously ultimately onto their children as well. So I think as parents, people living in families, supporting other people, this is a summary of what we need to do. We need to see the risks and the opportunities. We should see the technology as being used for good or not so good things. It's about how they use it. We need to be not overly deterministic. We need to think about the human behind the technology, the heart behind the stone cold technology that our children are using. We need to see judgments, wisdom as the most important quality that we should be educating our children. We need to understand that education does have a role. It's not just going to happen. or We can't just leave it to other people. We need to be explicit in our educational approaches. We need to play with our children online. We need to have fun with them. We need to be digital immigrants. We need to join them in their world. We need to allow them to teach us a lot about these things. Um, and it's, I think if we can show these qualities and the qualities in the React and Thrive model, then we're able to come together in partnership with our children to ensure that the world is much more likely, or the online cyber world is much more likely to be a place where all of us are able to flourish within. So I'm going to stop there. Thank you. Have I got five minutes? Yeah, so we've got time for about, about five minutes of questions. Okay. Great, so I believe I've got about five minutes for uh, questions uh, and there's some microphones around. So we've got a gentleman just here, uh, number one, and then we've got a two at the back. The number one. Yes, uh, many thanks for this brilliant presentation. I have an easy question. Good. What does it mean to be human? So, okay. I said we've got five minutes. <laughs> um, 
obviously there's a very complex answer to that. What I'm mainly talking about here is sometimes we get so distracted by the technology, we forget that it's actually us that are using that technology. It's us, even down to the basics, it's us who's choosing to turn the technology on or off. It's us who's choosing how we actually write. And when I talk about being human in the models, what I'm talking about is reminding all of us, including myself, that we can't let the... There's people talking about something called a singularity right now. That it sounds very scary, that human and technology are just going to merge into one and where it's all going to be one, and then ultimately, in sci-fi, the technology takes over. I don't know what's going to happen in the future, but what I do know right now is that we are in charge of this technology. It may not feel like it, it may feel that it's grabbing our attention, it may feel that it's drawing us away from things, but we are making those decisions. And if we can help our children realize that they're making the decisions, and I think this, in both the narrow sense of what they do day to day, but also the broader sense for the world, we'll be in a better place. I've got number two at the back. Two, hi, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm number two? Yeah. yeah. Um, Zena from oh, I've got two twos. Oh. Uh, two twos. <laughs> shall, we, shall we go to the back and then yeah, three? Yeah, sure. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Hello, my, my name is Marcelo. I am from Uruguay. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, how do you think uh, the web and uh, artificial intelligence will be in 10 years? Do you think our priorities as humans will change? And in that case, if priorities change, will uh, values and virtues start changing? Okay, so that's a question about artificial intelligence and uh, kind of human and character. Firstly, thank you for your kind comments and also earlier, you're a very polite audience, but I suppose I've given a talk on character, so you, you, ha you have to show that, don't you? Um, the, uh, I, I, I mean, the honest truth is none of us know how artificial intelligence is going to change us. But I think it's a bit similar to the answer that I've just given a minute ago. Artificial intelligence is basically ones and noughts and different sorts of algorithms that actually helps to predict what our behavior is. Do we really want our lives to come down to loads of ones and noughts and things that are measurable? I don't think we want that. I think we want a lot of things in our life that we can't measure. You can't measure love. My wife tries to measure love, but <laughs> we can't. Thankfully, she's not here. She was going to come, actually. I would be in real trouble right now. But um, we can't, you know, I think our life has got to be full of things that we can't measure. So we don't know where artificial intelligence is going to take us, and it will do things a lot more convenient for us. But we should be always thinking, when we're looking at kind of TripAdvisor reviews or, people, or suggestions of what we should do for our life, I think we need to keep our brains always switched on and think, what do we think? What does real intelligence here in my head think, not what the artificial intelligence is trying to tell us? So I haven't got, a, I can't predict the future in terms of what artificial intelligence is going to do, but I think there are things we can do now that take the best of it, but still keep the core of what it means to be human. Number three. Hi, I'm Zena from Lebanon. You said that uh, to help our children grow in virtues. So, so they can control the technology and so on. Growing in virtues needs time, right? Many years. Pressing a button on their mobile phone, it takes less than one second. So how can you explain this? So, I'm sorry, just say the last bit again, just. Pressing on a button, it takes less than one second. Growing in virtues takes years. Okay. So how so, can you explain this? So on the button it says, so, it's very faster to press on a button on their mobile phone, yes. So they need time to learn virtues and to have the virtue uh, or to acquire a virtue. But sending a picture on their mobile phone that's not appropriate, it is less than one second. So it, we need, how can you explain this? Yeah, okay. I think I get you. Um, it's, it's interesting that actually I've written an article called Virtuous Reality rather than Virtual Reality because that's what we're aiming for is Virtuous Reality. And, and in a virtuous world, a lot of our children don't imagine, they think it's not the real world. In fact, it used to be IRL in real life is one of the, like uh, uh, FOMO or whatever else, LOL, you know, one of, one of the acronyms that was used. Because our children, my research has shown us, our children forget 
that they're not actually living uh, in the real world. They think what happens online doesn't really matter. And then it happens really instantaneous as well. And then they discover the consequences afterwards. I'll come back to the thing about the pause. I've got, and, and firstly, the, we've got to allow our kids to get this wrong. My friend I talked about, his friend Noah, got it wrong. My daughter's so far, it's been perfect. No, but, <laughs> no, she will make mistakes. She will make mistakes. And we've got to allow that because we make mistakes, that's what happens. But what's important for us as parents is what we do to help our children through that. When do we decide we need to go a bit more restrictive to put some more rules in place because there isn't enough of that time? When do we see that as an educational moment? A moment we can sit down, be an advisor and work with our children to actually help them through that situation and do something differently next time. I don't think we can stop and block out all the problems, whether it be sending the wrong text or things like that. We can only use those as moments to educate them, to help them that part. We okay, back we'll make this the, uh, the last one. Last question, okay. So what is the, there's a fine line between active supervision and spying on, the, on your children. <laughs> so how do we draw that line? And more importantly, how can we teach others? Because this is kind of like our role here. How can we teach others uh, effectively and convincingly that spying on their children is not the right way to do it? Okay. I mean, I know Ignatius is a great spy, so uh, <laughs> if, you want some if you want some hints on spying, here's your man. Um, <laughs> but um, I think that we need our children. You see that you can get all these different apps. I'm sure you've looked at it, different apps. I can perfectly mirror my daughter's phone. I can pick it up here if I wanted to and see exactly what she's doing on a mobile phone. And that's, that's a form of spying and mirroring. I've decided not to go down that route. I've got a rough idea how much she uses her phone, when she's using it. I'm in charge of the apps. So I think we need to find and I can't tell you what that is because you know your children. But you need to find that middle space, I think, between allowing them to do anything and having really hard and fast and almost mirrored phone rules, or maybe no technology at all. And I think all the answers on that are right. There could be a space for some children because they, you just trust your children and they are going to use that technology wisely. There may be a time to take the phones off them or to um, you know, have really restricted technology, but actually you need to know that space on where you are in between using the apps and technology to monitor. But actually monitoring only gets you so far. The best app out there for monitoring is actually yourself. You're the one who really knows what's going on in terms of that. You, can, you can't rely on apps. You can be too reliant on them. The second part of the question is how do you teach each other? I wish we shared more stories around these things. I learned more in the last week when my friend told him me about his son going through that issue than any book that I've actually read this week. But sometimes we're scared to tell other parents and share stories about what our children have done. Because we live in a society that we, we don't think our children are allowed to make mistakes or get things wrong. Growing up is about doing that. If we as parents are able to share those stories and conversations and dilemmas and issues with other parents, then I think we'd start to learn much better. So we need to be more open about the fragility, about the humanness of actually living here, that we don't, living in this world, that we don't always get things right. So I think actually a forum like these, where you can share and be open and be vulnerable, it's about vulnerability a lot of it. We have to be vulnerable to the fact that we aren't, we live in an imperfect world and we can't get or something right. If we can share those stories, then I think we can learn much more for them. I'm going to stop there. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Tom.